All right, so the basic idea of general relativity is similar to the basic idea of gauge theory, namely that the coordinates we use shouldn't be important. And so the, the uh, equation should look the same when we change our coordinates. Now the, the idea I'm going to be taking is that point P is a point in some higher dimensional flat space and our four dimensional space time is some is a manifold in that flat higher dimensional space. Um, and we can describe these points in terms of coordinates and the points P are events or locations that are physical whereas our coordinate system is more or less arbitrary. And um, the idea is that these points are in a higher dimensional space with a metric eta, which is minus one, 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 however many you need. And everything else is zero. And the coordinates of these, of the same point, we can label them in one system as with x, another system, and another system of coordinates with x prime. In each case, we have four values of x and four values of x prime. Of course, it could be that this space that we live in might have extra dimensions that are kind of tiny or are big but we can't get there. And that's another issue. In that case, our manifold is um, bigger than four dimensions and we should have more than four x's and x primes. And then the space, in, the flat space in which the points are actually located is even bigger. All right, but I'll be imagining that we can just get away with 4x's, 4x primes, 4x double primes, all for the same point P. Now, the, the most basic concept of what you already know, namely a scalar. A scalar is a a uh, field, first of all, a field is just any function in space time. A scalar field is one such that it, when it describes the same point P, that is to say x and x prime refer to the same point P, then B prime at x prime is the same as B of x. Okay, now there, because we want to pay attention to coordinates, we need to, and make sure that our equations are independent of the coordinate system, we need to pay a little bit of attention to how things transform. And the basic one is, uh, or one of the basic ones is said to be contravariant. So that's one de Blasian. And the archetypical contravariant vector is just the differentials of the coordinates. And you see that dx prime, the ith dx prime, is just the sum of partial x prime i partial xj dxj. So we have four of these guys. And if we're talking about a change in the point P, 
due to changes of coordinates in one system dx, another system dx prime, just by calculus they relate it this way, and this is how any contravariant vector will transform. And in fact, what really we'll be doing is we'll be talking about indices, and uh, indices that are upper are said to be contravariant, and that means that under a coordinate transformation they transform this way. And those things are called tensors that carry all those indices. Covariant. Blasios, um, are ones that transform like derivatives. So for example, the partial of B prime of X prime with respect to say X prime A is of course the partial of B of X with respect to X prime A. So I'm using A or I as going from 0 to 3. And this is then the sum over B of partial XB, partial X prime A, times the partial of B of X with respect to XB. Okay, so this is just calculus really, but this tells us how covariant objects transform and they transform like derivatives of scalars. And these things then are lower indices. These are, these will always be upper indices, and these guys are lower indices. And I luckily wrote this one higher on the board than that one. So I'm up to four de Blasio's. I think that maybe is enough for today. Um, um, but more generally, if you have something T, A, B, C, da, 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 X, Y, Z, then this is a tensor with uh, contravariant indices A, B, C, da, 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 covariant indices da, 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 X, Y, Z, and under a coordinate transformation, this is a partial. Under a coordinate transformation, the upper indices go like this and the lower indices go like that. Would anybody like to see a, an example of how something? Yes? Is that a yes? Sure. I'll take that as an implicit question. Okay, sorry. All right. Um, So let's consider something with two lower indices, and it's something that we'll be talking about later, namely the metric tensor. So this thing would be um, partial So that's how G would transform, something with two lower indices. It's just that we repeat this for each index. And so this then is the sum on CD goes from 0 to 3. C and D go from 0 to 3. So that's, that's why, that's, that's how a, a second rank covariant tensor transforms. If it were a second rank contravariant tensor, we'd have two derivatives, but they'd be upside down. They'd look like this. Now, what is um, a simple relation here is the following. Suppose we do this. Sum on i, a prime i, b prime i. So now we're summing over, over the one upper index, one lower index, summing over, summing from zero to three. But the same index, upper and lower. Well, this thing, of course, is sum 
on I, K, and L, this guy is contravariant, so it's AK partial X prime I partial XK. And this one is covariant, so it's BL partial XL partial X prime I. On the other hand, if we look at this, just focus on the sum over I and move this next to this, which is the way I should have written it. Uh, you then see that this is really just the partial of XL with respect to XK. So this is actually the sum I, uh, as the sum KL of AK BL partial XL with respect to XK. And of course that's just a chronic or delta. So that is some KL delta LK AK BL. And that's just a sum on K of AK BK. Okay. So the point is if you sum over the same index, one upper, two, indis, two, two instances of the same index, one upper, one lower, uh, the thing is invariant, you can just erase the problems. This is called a contraction. Okay, just a word about forms. Um, forms are acute notation cute way of using anti-symmetry to write things in invariant ways, invariant forms. And they were invented by the son of a blacksmith, whose son's name is Ailey Cartan, and he's one of the most famous mathematicians, died in 51, 1951. Okay, well, the trivial case is a zero form. And this is just a scale of fields, say P of X, function F of X. And um, if we're thinking of X as coordinates for points in space time, then in fact F prime of X prime is F of X. Um, so in other words, we say F prime of X prime is F of X because f prime of x prime is the function f at the point p whose coordinates are x prime, and that's the same as the point, that's the same point as the point whose coordinates are x, and consequently, and because it's a scalar, they're just exactly the same. Now, a one form is something like this, a prime, is a prime, say, i, px prime i. But of course, this is a contraction, because this is contravariant, that's covariant. So this is also a k, px k, and we only write that simply, whoops, as a. So for one, for the one form a is invariant. You write it as a k dx k, and it's the same as a prime on a prime on. So that's the cute thing about one of the cute things about forms is that they're intrinsically invariant. Um, let me just mention a, a two form. Uh, an example is f, which will be f i k dx i wedge dx. Okay, now what is wedge? Wedge means it's anti-symmetric. Okay. Dxi wedge dxk is minus dxk wedge dxi. So by using this notation, we only preserve here the anti-symmetric part of it. So that's a two-form. And in general, you can have a p-form 
And so that would be, oh, some, some capital F I1, I2, IP, DX1, wedge, DX2, wedge, wedge, DXP. So this would be then a P form. All right, now Cartan introduced something else that's sort of the opposite of the differential, uh, of the differentials like this. It's called the exterior derivative. And acting on a zero form, just a function, EF is just defined as partial F, partial XI, EXI. So it takes a zero form and turns it into a one form. And it's convenient to avoid having to write partial line, partial variable i. One, also, one often writes this as f simply comma i dx i. So that's, that's, our, that's what the exterior derivative does. Okay, that's what it does to a zero form. How about to a one form? Well, let's ha have it act on a. So this would be d on, let us say, a k dxk. Well, this is the derivative on this, and then it kicks out a different. See, what this did is it differentiates and kicks out a differential. Or, uh, okay. So, and, and if it's differentiating with respect to xi, it kicks out dxi in an anti-symmetric way. So this will be a k comma i, the i-th derivative, dxi wedge dxk. Okay, well that's that's interesting. That has turned a one form into a two form. Now, um, suppose suppose we acted a second time with this, and in fact, this particular two form is actually in the case of um, if A is a field. An abelian field, say the electromagnetic field, then this dA is what we call F. In other words, it's 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 the F, the field strength, Maxwell's field strength tensor. Now what's dF? Well dF of course is going to be D on dA. And it says this is D then on A, how did I write? K comma I dx I with dxk. And so this is derivative. So first we differentiate. So it's A K comma I J dxj with dx I with dxk. All right, but now there's something special that happens because these two guys are symmetric because they're just derivatives with respect to i and j. These two guys are anti-symmetric because the wedge, if it's anything, it's anti-symmetric. Like, it's hard, it's hard to imagine that it's anything but just sort of a flag that says anti-symmetric. So this thing is zero. And in fact, um, that's, uh, That's a, um, a, a relativistic Lewin variant statement there. All right, let me just say something else. This, what we say here then is F is closed. Oh, what am I, seven de Blasio's? <laughs> uh, F is closed, and it's uh, locally exact. Closed means that df is zero. That's what closed means. Exact means that that f is dA. Well, here we've defined f to be dA, so f is, I shouldn't say it's locally exact, it's 
bloody well exact just by definition. One more um, thing about forms. They, Stokes' theorem uh, takes a very nice form in, these, in this notation of um, of um, Cartan's forms. Suppose we integrate the exterior derivative acting on some form, some form, P form, whatever, over a certain region. It turns out this is exactly the same thing as H integrated over what the mathematicians write as partial R. What they mean is the boundary of R. The surface. So that's that's the fancy form for uh, for Stokes' theorem. All right. Now let's get back to um, GR. So uh, something about coordinates, covariant, contravariant. Something about forms. And um, next we can imagine. changing the point P a little bit. And so this thing is then EI of X DXI. And if you want, you can say sum I from 0 to 3. So this, this says, what's the change in the point in this higher dimensional space if we've changed our coordinates a little bit? And of course, this has to be the same thing Remember that this uh, this is a uh, this is a covariant vector. This is contravariant, so we can also write this as e i uh, e prime i e x prime i because it's a contraction, one up or one lower index, and. Now I want to um, define something. Well, let's, let's instead of defining it, let me do something different. Let's see what the length of this thing is. dp dot dp, which is dp squared. What is that distance in the higher dimensional space? But we're referring to two points on our four-dimensional manifold. So we're really always talking about points that are in the space we know about. Well, of course, this is going to be EI dxi dotted into, well, I should say this is, what is this? This is dp <coughs> dot dp. So this is uh, dp a, say, a to a, b, dp, b. That's a way of thinking about it that way. But we can also think of it this way. That is to say, we write one dp as a sum of ei dxi and the other one as a sum of ej dxj. And so what this is, is it's an ei of x dotted into ej of x times dxi dxj. And now, what is this? This is this inner product of these vectors that are in this higher dimensional space. And the point X is in the space, four dimensional space we know about, but these EIs may have, have as many dimensions as they need. And so this thing is what we call GIJ of X, DXI, DXJ. So in other words, the inner product of these two vectors is defined in this simple way gives us a way of saying what the distance is between two points on our four-dimensional manifold that's embedded into this huge space. Right. And this, of course, is called the metric tensor. It's
it's a strength two covariant with two lower radices. Okay, and we can also define another tensor by the following rule. In other words, the inverse of the metric tensor, well, it has to satisfy this rule. Okay, now there's something I forgot to mention. It's in my notes somewhere, but I, I think maybe this is the time to mention it. One of the great conveniences of this notation of upper and lower indices is that if you have an equation like this, where this is a tensor, this is an invariant tensor, this is a t covariant tensor, rank two. This one has to be a rank two contravariant tensor. That's called the quotient theorem. Quotient. Theorem. I'm abbreviating that that's only half of the class of the system. So I'll do about 10. Um, so this is, that, that's the inverse of the metric tensor. And now, if we have um, any old uh, covariant vector, say, and we multiply it by any tensor AK, then again, by the quotient theorem, we know that this is some something that has to be a tensor that with one contravariant index. But here's the deal. If we use the inverse of the metric tensor to raise it, then we just call this B. So in other words, the, we can use the metric tensor to raise indices. And it's just because the, the metric tensor is defined with upper indices, defined to be the inverse of the lower one, it follows that we can use the lower index, lower metric tensor, the metric tensor, this metric tensor, to lower indices. So in general, that's just the nature of the notation. So in other words, we say BK would be GKL BF. So if we use G, I mean, if this were any covariant tensor, this guy on the left would be a rank one covariant tensor. But if we use G, we keep the same symbol. And that's consistent with G, in, with G upper and G lower being inverses. Because if we just um, did this again and we raised BK, well, we just get that. So it's, and, and moreover, GKL acting on G with upper indices would just give us a quantum delta. So you can play with that if you want, but I think I'll try to move on, although I may be going too fast, I'm not sure. Okay, now there's a, a thing called the Levy Chivitas symbol. This is not a tensor, it's just a symbol. And in four dimensions, it's epsilon A, B, C, D. And it's the same thing as epsilon A, B, C, D. And epsilon 0, 1, 2, 3 is 1. In my notation, at least. And of course, have two conventions here. It's going to be 1 or minus 1. Um, there are some perverts who use minus 1. But <laughs> Um, <laughs> I avoid these versions. Um, it's a symbol. Oh, we've got some static here. I'll have to tell them. Scary about that. Now, to make it a tensor, we do this. We do A to I, J, K, L as square root of G, epsilon, I, J, K, L. What's G? G is the absolute value of the determinant of the metric tensor. 
So G, absolute value determinant GAB set. Are you using eta for an arbitrary dimensional one and G for a four dimensional? What is your. It is, you mean, so what if we had three of these or five of these? No, what I'm asking is what's the difference between your eta AB and G? Between eta AB and G AB. Oh, huge! Because eta A. Oh, all right, okay. You, 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 I'm just you asking pointed my out a terrible uh, uh, a screw up in my notation. Yeah, yeah this, the eta that, that eta is only going to appear once, okay. essentially. Um, this eta is uh, the pseudo tensor that you can make from the Levy Chibita symbol. And, you know, maybe I should have called it L for Levi Chibita or LC. Um, the eta over there, you see, this thing is totally anti symmetric. That one is symmetric, and it only has two indices. All right, but probably you were just hungry when you asked that question. So let me toss you a good catch, good catch. Uh, I call this a pseudo tensor. That's because um, if you flip space but not time, it doesn't change. Okay, so we were talking a little bit back here about Maxwell's equation, about Maxwell's, about first of all the one form A, and then the two form. F, which is dA. And now, um, what are uh, Maxwell's equations? Well, first of all, um, we can, it turns out that because, all right, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but that's the way it is in the notes. Because S J K is anti-symmetric, half of the Blasio. Take the ith derivative, multiply by epsilon a i j k i j i j k. What do we get? Well, we get zero. And um, this, this fact that this is zero, this is the thing that occurred over here. Namely, um, didn't I do that or did I skip that? Yes, df. You see this equals zero. This thing is totally anti-symmetric. And so it's playing the same role as the uh, Levi Chivita symbol. And so this is the statement that F is dA, so d d a is zero, so dF is zero. This is the dF equals zero. These are the homogeneous Maxwell equations. The homogeneous Maxwell equations. And in general relativity, they take exactly this form. In other words, they follow just from the, the language of forms. You don't even need the general relativity or the special relativity. You have exactly the, the these are Maxwell's <coughs> equations, at least on the classical level, they're exact in, um, in general and special relativity. And that's one of the remarkable things about Maxwell's equations, namely even though they were formulated at the time of the U.S. Civil War, or like 150 years ago. Um, these uh, equations were almost exactly right. And in fact, um, these equations are exactly right, at least on the classical level. Um, these particular equations are delta B equals zero and curl B plus B dot equals zero. 
So um, these are the uh, homogeneous Maxwell equations. The inhomogeneous Maxwell equations, let me tell you what they are in general relativity. They change only a little bit. differ only by having the square root of the absolute value of the determinant of the metric tensor that pops up in two places. Apart from that, it's just the standard divergence of the field strain tensor equals mu zero times the current. So in other words, if in flat space, and you know, our space is pretty damn flat, um, if you do, then in that case, this guy is just one, that's one, and you just get the ordinary Maxwell equations, as Maxwell um, derived them. And, uh, okay. Well, that's, that's really pretty remarkable. That, um, uh, that Maxwell got electrodynamics He got it almost perfectly correct. And of course, the reason why was A, he was very smart, and B, uh, the electromagnetic interactions are long range and of a strength that was accessible to experimentation in the 18th and 19th centuries. What we got with gravity, of course, is that it's long range. But it's very, very, very weak. And so one needed to be as smart as Einstein to figure this stuff. Okay. okay, now, um, let's think about um, differentiating um, various things. And this will get us to the notion of covariant derivatives as they appear in general relativity, which is different from the way they appear in um, uh, what I want to say. I lost the thought, sorry. The reason I lost the thought is another thought came in, pushed it out of my head. Namely, that um, Bloomberg today announced uh, the salaries of some of the hedge fund managers. Coming in number one was some guy, whose name I forget, who earned 1.3 billion last year in fees. Coming in number two was a guy named Simons. Simons, turns out, was a very good, is a very good mathematician. And in fact, there are, there's a, a quantity related to forms and to non being gauge theory called churn simons term or churn simons theory or whatever. It's that Simons, S-I-M-O-N-S. Anyway, he came in at 1.2 million. He was number two. Um, and he, he started a company called Renaissance Technologies. It's a hedge fund. And then um, Okay, that's the thought that crowded out what the hell I was going to say before. Um, all right, so let's let's just think about an invariant quantity here, which is um, this is a different way of writing forms. Um, this is the way I like to write them. Uh, Cartan's Cartan's way is to write them in terms of differentials. We can also write things that are invariant if we write it this way. So now this is one upper, one lower index, so clearly it's going to be invariant under general coordinate transformations. But now suppose we take its derivative with respect to some of our uh, coordinates. What do we get? Well, we get partial fi, partial xl ei, plus fi, partial ei, partial xl. 
Now here's the, here's the amusing thing. This EI is a vector in our huge embedding space. And so the derivative of it uh, need not be parallel to the manifold. And um, so in other words, uh, Uh, let's see, I actually have a nice example in my book and I can't quite think of it. In other words, this guy is, point, is, is pointing out of the manifold. The derivative, the EI is actually in the manifold because uh, the EI is the, the, tells us how P, the point P changes when we change the coordinates. When we change the coordinates, we stay on the manifold. So the EIs are parallel to the manifold, but their derivatives aren't. And okay. And in order to keep them in the manifold, what we do is we take a dot product. Oh, let me just say something about these. We have these EIs. We can define new vectors EK. So it's the EK dot EL is delta KL. So in other words, an upper index. These are the these vectors are dual to those vectors. These are the basic vectors that are defined in terms of derivatives of points. But when you have a bunch of vectors, uh, and these E's aren't orthonormal, of course, because the inner product of the E's gives us, well, I should write that more nicely, EI dot EJ, of course, is the metric tension, EIJ. So these E's aren't necessarily orthonormal. Like in general aren't, although in our flat space they almost are. Um, I mean, the extent to which the universe is pretty much flat. Um, so when you have a bunch of vectors that um, aren't uh, orthonormal, you can form dual vectors such that the dual, the inner product of the dual vector is orthonormal. By the way, since this inner product is symmetric, the metric tensor is necessarily symmetric. Of course, again, this is um, th this is a a simple way of doing GR. You can say, well, maybe there's no embedding space. Maybe this world is incredibly mysterious, and you know, God help us. Uh, in that case. Um, the GIJ maybe could even be um, have an anti a part that's not symmetric. Okay, anyway, so now we take these dual vectors and dot them into partial F, partial XL. Well, this one is going to be orth orthogonal. In other words, it's partial FI, partial XL, EI, plus FI, partial EI, partial XL. That on that is orthogonal, that's delta KI, F, partial FI, partial XL. And then this one is FI, EK dotted into partial EI, partial X. And so this thing is partial FK, partial XL, plus FI, EK dot, partial EI, partial XL. Okay. So this is what happens when you have, uh, when you differentiate one of these invariant quantities, and you can see this is going to be something that's going to have one upper index and one lower index. And in fact, what we call this is F K semicolon L. So this is the covariant derivative. And in fact, if, if I'm a little bit more consistent, then I would say um, F K semicolon L is K comma L plus F I E K dot 
dot, or let me write it with a comma notation, EI comma L. And this quantity here, um, I think that's a nice way of writing it, but the relativists are not content with that. They introduce something called gamma, and they call this connection. And this is just by definition, EK dot EI comma L. On the other hand, EI is already the partial of the point with respect to XI. So this thing is EK dot P comma IL. But that's the same as EK dot P comma LI, which is gamma ALI. So the con this thing is called the levy chivita connection. And you see it's a connection in the sense that the covariant derivative, which is this, is that plus the connection times that. And so this thing is um, F K comma L plus gamma K I L F I. So that's the way the covariant derivative appears for a contravariant. And this is the levy chivita connection, and it's it's symmetric on the lower two lower two indices. Now one can say, well, maybe our four-dimensional manifold isn't embedded in some higher space. And in that case, you have a theory with torsion. And in the theory with torsion, you'd be you'd have a torsion tensor, which would be gamma A B C minus gamma A gamma. A, C, B. And the way I formulated things, this is identically zero. But if you want to be more general, you allow the possibility that it's not zero. OK. Um, all right, let me, let me do a few things. Um, To, to, uh, so far, we've been just talking about ways of writing things in ways that are coordinate independent, and, or at least saying how various things will transform when you have uh, coordinate um, independence. Um, I should give you, first of all, the, the uh, a formulation of the covariant derivative for, for the case of um, of a vector that is, uh, co is covariant as opposed to contravariant. So let me jump to, this is all chapter 11 of my book, but um, let me go to section 28. Yeah. Well, okay, there's something cool about, about this, and it's the, the idea of parallel transformations. So I must be up to about 12 as well as you. I hope she watches this time. Um, So what we've been doing here is basically defining the, um, well, first of all, what is parallel transport? The idea is that you move a vector along a curve on the manifold, our four-dimensional manifold, so that its direction in successive tangent spaces does not change. I'll give you an example in a minute. So for example, suppose the vector is f, which is f i e i. And what we want is we want e k dot 
the change in F to be zero. But that's just EK dot partial F partial X K XL say uh, I should have said DXL. Alright, let me put it DXL. And so this then would be partial FK partial XL plus and now this EK would give us gamma K LI FI and all of that DXL. And this would be then the covariant derivative FK semicolon L DXL. And we would want then that that vanish. So we want the we would want the covariant, by the way, this is not J, this is a semicolon. J, I guess, is a fine J of bad letters to use. So give, let me give you an example of um, parallel transport. And in fact, I'm going to do it in a way that, um, that I can understand it and you can understand it rather than the way that um, makes it hard for, for all of us. So let's imagine that we're just talking about the Earth and the North Pole and so forth. And so this, uh, here's the North Pole, here's the x-axis going out on the center, that way. Here's the y-axis going out this way, and then, you know, by state law, this has to be the z-axis. Um, um, so, so let's take, let's parallel transport the vector C down from the North Pole along this meridian. Well, phi, of course, is the partial derivative of the point, namely a point on the surface of this sphere with respect to phi. Phi is the angle that way. And so phi is always a vector that points, uh, it's pointing really in the y direction, isn't it? it And so all along this whole thing, uh, this vector phi hat is 0, 1, 0. On this whole, so we're transporting it in a parallel, we're parallel transporting it down this uh, meridian um, to the equator. And now we're going to go across here. And again, we're going to do it uh, parallel transported, porting it uh, along the equator. But when it gets here, it's now pointing in the minus x direction. Okay, because it was just pointing. Well, it's it's it's, it's basically in the phi hat direction. And so now it's pointing in the minus x direction. Now we can parallel transport up to here, and it doesn't change at all in that case. So altogether in this, from here to there to there, we've gone from 0, 1, 0 to minus 1, 0, 0, coming back to the same point. And the reason for that is that we parallel transported the vector along a closed, back to a point, but on a closed manifold, on a curved manifold. We had done the curved surface of the Earth, curved in the sphere. Um, if we had done this on a flat surface, it would have come back uh, not, without any change at all, because if we had just done this on some flat surface, then it would have started out this way, it would have been that way, it would have been that way, and the whole parallel transport would have looked like that. But if the manifold transported on is heard, then I can get it. Now, um, let's see. 
let me let me just really quickly say if we think about F as a uh, a covariant vector, uh, in other words, F L E L, then we'd be doing something like this, um, and we and and. We, we call this, I want to do a D on that. So this would be EK dot FL comma, um, let's see what variable, oh, I used L. I think I'll just define the thing um, and encourage you to read 1130. Uh, the, the covariant derivative of a covariant vector, it's EI dot V comma L, where V is, um, V, no, let's see, what index am I going to use? VK, VK. So that's the way the, that's the invariant representation of V in terms of covariant components. We then uh, define this thing as EI dot that, and then what we get is V uh, I comma L minus VK gamma K I L. And so that's the way the covariant derivative acts on a, on a covariant index. And the difference basically is that you get a minus sign, the plus sign turns into a minus sign. Um, um, it turns out that one can um, express this, uh, these connections in terms of derivatives. I, I'm going to skip over the derivation. I'll just give you the result. This thing is one half GSK. Probably would have done a better job than Madame Lagarde. I don't know. It does have a certain reputation. Okay, in terms of derivatives of the metric tensor, that's the way you can write the connection. That's a, a equation 11, 255. I, I, I think we just have to skip a little bit here. And now, um, let's consider the uh, metric tensor and its covariant derivative. It turns out to be zero. This is just a computation, but we don't have enough time to really go through that. Um, there is one really nice relation. Again, I don't have time to derive it. But let me just um, uh, well, I think actually now I've got that here. Yeah, if we take the, these Christoffel uh, symbols and sum over I, which of course is a contraction, what we get is something that's much simpler than you imagine. It's the case derivative of the square root of g divided by the square root of g. So it's a much simpler expression. This is worked out in the uh, text. Um, let me quickly get to um, some definitions then. We've got this uh, Christoffel symbol or this connection, if you will, which um, I'm trying to see. Oh, yeah. Here's a nice uh, definition of it. We can think of this then as, uh, as a gauge field. 
connections play the role of gauge fields. And we can define a Riemann tensor, Ri MNK. And you remember the field strength in Yang Mills theory is the commutator of two covariant derivatives. We can do the same thing here. We take the ordinary derivative plus gamma k n plus gamma n. And now this thing has two loose indices, and those indices are i and m. And that defines the, uh, the Riemann uh, tensor. We then get the Ricci tensor by uh, contracting that. And so we get R M K is uh, Riemann N M N K. So this is down one level. And now we get an absolute scalar by contracting uh, M with uh, K. So we do G M K on R M K. And so this then is the, the, the you know, what do we call it? We call it the Riemann scale, the Ricci scale? Ricci scale. Huh? Ricci scale. Ricci. Ricci scale. All right, let's call it the Ricci scale. Okay, if, now that's, that's the, uh, the, G, the gravity side. But there's also, we're also talking about matter. And we're going to make a, an action for gravity and an action for matter. The action for matter is going to have this funny sort of very convenient definition. Namely, that the change in the matter action is minus a half an integral tik square root of g delta g i k d4 x. Okay. So we're integrating over space time to get something that's an action. And um, we're defining the stress energy tensor T by this equation, square root of G, that the change in the matter action, if we change the metric tensor just a little, and here we're talking about the change in the inverse of the metric tensor. We can say if we change the metric tensor a little, then the change in the matter action has this form, minus a half tik square root of g, change in gik d fourth x. Okay. The um, whole action is um, the the Einstein action, which is minus c to the fourth over 16 pi Newton's constant, integral r square root of g d fourth x plus the matter action. And now, if we um, vary, if we say, what is the equation motion that if we require the total action to be stationary with respect to small variations of the metric tensor, then uh, there's a little bit of algebra to do here, but what you finally find out is you get Rik minus a half Gik R equals minus 8 pi big G C to the fourth TIJ. And so you see, by, um, by this clever definition, we, we've gotten down just this, this TIJ. So those are the equations of general relativity. Um, all right. So I'm going to uh, stop there for, for this development. And now I thought I would try to say a little bit about um, oh some of the simple physical effects and and the one that um, 
I thought I would talk about is the one that, uh, let's see, what is the, uh, well, our ds squared, or if you want dp squared, which people also write as ds squared, this thing is uh, gab dxa dxb. So this is the this is the invariant distance between two points. And now, why is it the invar Why is it invariant? It's invariant because these are physical points, whereas the, these guys are our crazy coordinates. Mm -hmm. And um, let's go to weak fields. Weak gravitational fields. In that case, G00, well, it's minus 1, and then minus 2 phi over C squared, where phi, it turns out, is minus, if we're talking about a, a, a point that's a distance r, from a mass capital M, and phi is this. So if we're talking about the field here, r is the distance to the center of the Earth's. Um, although we might need to worry about the sun. Anyway, this thing is minus 1 plus 2 gm over c squared r. So what is uh, d tall? Um, so, in other words, in, in these coordinates, um, we just have a, uh, a time, the thing isn't moving at all. So this is square root of minus g00 dt, and so this is square root of 1 minus 2gm over c squared r dt. Okay, so what do we have? We have that as we, if we're in a region of strong mass, then d tau is smaller than dt. And um, so I'm reminded of a movie I watched a few days ago called Interstellar. And in Interstellar, these guys are, unfortunately, they have to spend a little time near black hole, and there it's not even weak fields, it's quite a strong field. And uh, so the time that, um, if these are the coordinates on Earth, the time that goes by is just very, very little. And so when they get back, uh, everybody they knew is either dead or um, quite old. Um, of course, I find being old is not all that bad. Um, anyway, uh, so that, that's just an example of um, time dilation in GR. Um, they're, they're, this was actually first measured at Harvard by a professor named Pound um, and a graduate student named Ripka. He might have been a postdoc. Anyway, what they did was um, the physics laboratory had a staircase that went all the way up to the fourth or fifth floor, and I guess down to the basement. And so they basically um, had a they had a laser shooting a beam down from uh, the top to the bottom. And what they used to measure the very small change is they used what was what was new in those days, and that was the Morse power effect. And so the Morse power effect meant that um, you could measure change, very small changes of frequency, and um, they got agreement with this. Um, uh, in other words, a photon that was, was blue shifted when it hit the bottom because the time was low. Any questions? All right, I guess we're done.